Okay. Um, now, this next uh, panel discussion uh, is entitled rather snappily, Day After Tomorrow, How Climate Change Affects the Future of Insurance. And I know we are going to be talking about uh, various perils and which ones are the most <coughs> perilous uh, conversation we were just having backstage. Uh, more interesting than it sounds, believe it or not. And, but joining me on this panel uh, today, uh, as you can see from the names behind me, we have uh, Adam Rimmer, who's uh, CEO of uh, Flood Flash. Uh, Adam first saw the potential of parametric or event-based insurance while working at RMS, the world's largest catastrophe modelling firm, which I, I love that as a concept. Uh, whilst there, he met Flood Flash uh, co-founder Ian, and together they structured and modelled triggers on over $2 billion of parametric uh, insurance products and catastrophe bonds to protect governments and large corporations in the US and around the world. Uh, next to him is Johnny Stubbs, uh, partnerships at Provisico, sorry. Uh, Johnny recently joined the company to manage and drive partnerships across the UK and US insurance markets, and he's got experience working in the insurtech space, having previous, previously been the UK head of insurance and business development at GetSafe and an operations manager at insurtech unicorn Zego. Um, Finally on our panel is Jamie Rodney. He's the CEO of Risk. As CEO, Jamie is responsible for driving business forward by providing innovative and practical products to the market. With extensive commercial experience underpinned by academic success, Jamie embodies Risk's combined ambition of scientific excellence and pragmatic solutions. So we're going to dive straight in here. And obviously, we're going to be talking about climate change. And obviously, we all know it's a... Um, a existential issue that often gets pushed down the agenda with other things that are happening around the world. We've had geopolitical uncertainty, we've got war in Europe, um, now we've got another financial crisis looming, inflation and everything else. So it's really hard to still keep climate change front of mind and top of the agenda. You only have to look at COP27, for instance, to see how many world leaders are copping out, if you like, for want of a better phrase, um, to see that um, there are priorities around the world, and maybe climate change is not getting the attention it deserves. So, but from an insurance perspective, uh, Adam, I'm going to come to you first. Uh, what are the challenges that are facing underwriters when it comes to climate crisis assessment? So, to me, the big challenge that is that is you know going to engulf the, particularly the catastrophe insurance industry over the next few years is the fact that the the future is starting to look less and less like the past. You know, if we're losing, doing most insurance products, like, you know, car insurance, to take a simple example, we can look at all the policyholders we had previously, we can look at how many crashes they had, how, what, their, what their claims were, and we can use actuarial statistics to work out with a pretty reasonable degree of accuracy um, what claims might be in the future. Um, for, for something f that is that is inherently dependent on the stability of the climate, so, for example, you know, the number of tropical cyclones that might form any year that you know that Jamie and his team will work on, or like you know the number of floods that might happen in the UK every every year that like Johnny and his team might work on, that is starting to become harder and harder to use historical data sets to predict. So that increase we're in, in we're in unknown territory. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You don't you can't use the past to extrapolate to the future in the same way that you previously could. Um, so that increase in uncertainty is the big challenge facing underwriters as the climate crisis descends upon us. Um, and on top of that, you know, even outside the climate, the climate sphere, you have other, um, you know, other pressures as well. You know, the ones that you just mentioned are meaning that, you know, costs are you have more and more important factor for everybody, not just households, but for small businesses and for large businesses as well. Um, so, you know, even without the pressures of like of an uncertain underwriting in, in, in the catastrophe insurance space, it is becoming more and more difficult for underwriters anyway because of those increased costs. So uncertainty and costs, those are the big challenges that underwriters are having to deal with. OK, and then obviously we know that, you know, technology is one way that we can try and gain a bit more insight in, into this and, and also tackle some of these issues. Um, so, um, Jamie, what technologies are proving most useful, would you say, in discerning risk and collecting the data? And what, te what technologies are needed to do this? So what do we still need and how is technology being implemented? I guess, first off, PR stunt. I can say the name of the company. It's Riosk, not Risk. Okay. We are co-founded by French people, so in, in French, Riosk is Risk. <laughs> um, but we are a company that uses 
in-depth observations of the climate to do exactly what Adam said. We have a slogan, today's risk is not the past. You can't look at things that happened 10, 20, 30 years ago in a climate that's significantly different. That means as a company, we were really founded out of the technology that we have today. Um, I think if we tried to create the company 10 years ago, I don't think we would have been able to. Um, what we do is we now take observations of the climate, sort of on 25 kilometer grid cells. These are sort of top, top, top academics in Europe, in the US, improving the ways that we can observe the state of the climate, if that's sea surface temperature, wind speed, soil moisture. And they sort of do this thing called reanalysis where they sort of match up observations, do these really funky computer simulations. They do this all the way back to 1950. And this is continuously improving. The resolution's improving. The way they recreate this data is improving. But it's not just the past, it's the current and the future. Uh, we now have improvements in seasonal weather prediction, one to six months ahead, again, of this global state of the climate. And we also have future predictions of the climate. These are things that are just evolving probably over the last five to 10 years at a rate of speed that allows us to do what we do. In fact, the technology that we use is, was actually came before the advancements in the data, probably the scientific papers that we use probably were published in the noughties, but the data was actually a little bit behind and then the company was founded in 2018, the data caught up and now we can do all these really cool things, look at correlations between different types of physical based, you know, climate phenomenon, sea surface temperature, soil moisture, mm -hmm. and look at how that impacts the risk that we quantify, which as a company is tropical cyclone risk. Um, but we also have ambition to model every single atmospheric peril globally. Uh, climate is global. You need a global system. You need to understand it in a global connected way. Um, so we're on more on the software side. I know, Adam, you guys have sort of launched a company focusing more on the hardware side, but probably the same goes for you. I don't think you could, could have probably created your company. That's, so. com that's completely true. So, so for, so, so flood flash is what's called the parametric insurance product. Um, so we, uh, pay not based on the cost of damage, but based on a physical parameter that we measure. So in our case, that is a the depth of water. And we measure that by a IoT sensor that we install on the external wall of a property that detects water of a certain depth that sends the data to us, and then we can we can settle the settle the claim. Um, in what typically would have taken months, you know, we can we can now. Well, when Storm Christoph hit the UK earlier this year, you know, we were able to settle a full commercial flood claim in full in five hours and thirty six minutes, which is pretty astonishing. Um, but just as you say, Jamie, ten years ago we couldn't have done that, right? The things like um, IoT networks, like narrowband IoT, Cat M1, these like low uh, these um, low power. IoT networks and radio networks that allow us have brought down the cost of these sensors down to a point where we can make these at a unit cost that allows us to sell this type of policy to small businesses, ultimately even like homeowners, rented properties, um, and not just the preserve of people like the giant corporations that we used to work on, um, you know, in our in our days at RMS that you mentioned that you mentioned in the intro. Um, it's allowed us to to democratise this technology to ultimately protect more people from catastrophe, um, and that's exactly what we're trying to do at Flood Flash. Okay, well, this all sounds very positive. I have to say, more positive than I was expecting this conversation <coughs> to be. Uh, maybe, Johnny, maybe you can um, uh, change tack slightly here. Um, in what ways? Or can the insurance industry help to tackle climate change? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a few areas that they can they can definitely help on. I think the first is there's an education piece. Um, so insurers can really leverage the relationship they have, particularly with commercial customers, to um, kind of help inform them on the increased volatility that that Adam's referring to, to uh, let them know that the sort of historic data. Is not as, is not as relevant as it, as it, is, as it used to be. Um, so in doing so, they can kind of upskill their customers to understand the risk that they're now facing. Um, and I think there's, there's still a huge knowledge gap. Um, you know, we, we focus on um, flash flooding in the UK. Um, a lot of our commercial customers don't believe it's an issue for them, but they just don't fundamentally understand. So I think for... Um, for insurers to be able to kind of step in there. That's a, that's a big opportunity. Um, kind of building on that, there's then a kind of collaboration piece. So taking that education beyond to, okay, well, what do we do with this? Um, and I think helping um, commercial customers to become more resilient. So identifying opportunities to basically build resilience at a property level. Um, I think that's, 
that's a kind of big space for, for the insurance market to kind of move into. Um, and then I think finally, <clears throat> and we kind of alluded to historic data is no longer going to be a great predictor of the future. So um, how can insurers uh, take on new data sources? How can they take on new models that are more predictive, um, that allow them to become more preventative in their approach to insuring their customers? Um, I think there's a, a, a really big opportunity there that a lot of insurers are sort of starting to move into. Just want to ask a question here about the historic data. I mean, we're not just um, completely throwing that out, right? We're not dismissing it completely, because surely there must be um, a trajectory that that data suggests. So in a way, it is still useful, it's, but um, it's, I, I understand that it's sort of you know, out of date and it's, it needs a complete rethink, but there must be some trajectory and trends within that data that actually are useful. Oh, actually, sorry, could you, could you use this? You're having a problem with your microphone. Yeah, yeah absolutely. The, um, the, when these catastrophe models are being built, um, even when we're trying to extrapolate into an uncertain future, we're still using the past as, a, um, as an input. Right? It just becomes it's no longer the only input, and we have to increase the bounds of uncertainty with which we're simulating those, those, those past observations. So, like, you know, for example we might be modeling the way that um, floods accumulate in the UK based on, um, based on certain patterns of rainfall that we've seen over the last 20 years, for example. Um, when, we're, when we're looking forward, we're still gonna use those same patterns that we've observed from the last 20 years, but we have to say, okay, the patterns might not just fit in similar patterns to that 20 years, but there's also, they might go beyond it. They might go beyond it this way. They might go beyond it this way. They might change in frequency. They might change in intensity. Um, so, the, so you're absolutely correct. The past is, you know, we don't throw that out. It's still a, it's still a reference point. Um, but then, but we can't, but we can't rely on 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 just that, and we have to go go beyond it. It is, it's an important yeah. point actually, and this is, as a company, we've thought about this fundamentally. Um, as you said, Adam, typical models, they'll look at the last 20 years and they'll say, 20 years looks like that. Let's simulate a bit and extend it out to one in 50, one in 100. Uh, we started to think about how can we build models differently such that they don't necessarily extrapolate the past, but they take the climate of the past and simulate risk based on that. And if you physically drive your model, you can actually validate your model by saying, we don't calibrate to the past we can just reproduce the past. It's actually the strongest form of validation. So we don't calibrate our model. We give it the climate of the past and it reproduces the past, which is like great thumbs up, it works. We can then give it the climate of the future and it predicts the climate of the future or the risk associated with that climate. We can give it the climate in six months time, it reproduces the risk associated with that. So you can't throw history away, but you should think about how how you use it to validate your model. Um, and that's where uh, extrapolating history is a little bit ropey, um, can lead you a little bit in the wrong direction. It's highly sensitive. For us, we try to understand the physics of history and how often they reproduce. If sea surface temperatures are going to increase, if everything's warmer, then things are going to increase. Um, if everything's cooler, things might slow down. If history was a little bit warmer or a little bit cooler, you're just representing that state of the climate. Um, so that's how we think about calibrating, or well, not validating and not calibrating our model. Yeah. And that's, you know, for that, that's, you know, such an important principle of catastrophe modeling is that, you know, um, even outside of climate change, you're still trying to to understand, you know, what does a one in 200 year hurricane look like when you've only got sort of 50 years of hurricane history, for example. You know, I mean, I think not an atmospheric peril, but thinking of the Tohoku earthquake in Japan in 2011, you know, that was, um, I think it was you know, nine point, you know, it, it was nine point something, which is as huge as an earthquake goes. Um, I think before that earthquake, the catastrophe models didn't even think that you could have an earthquake of that magnitude along that fault. Um, so, because they'd only looked at like historical data and not accounted for the uncertainty for the uncertainty around it. Um, so, so yeah, that is that is a really important principle to think about these these rare events in general. Okay, staying with you, Adam, as well, because we've got we've got a lot to cover here. Um, what types of coverage are best suited to climate-related cover? Would you say? Yeah. So, um, in my, I talked about the. Pro the challenges that are facing underwriters earlier about uncertainty and about cost. Um, so the coverages that work for it, the work for this changing world are therefore ones that reduce uncertainty and reduce cost. Um, 
and the, the work from the work that um, Ian and I saw at RMS was this concept of parametric insurance. You know, so the one that really inspired what we were doing is a project that we worked on for the the subway in New York. That you know, you'll remember 2012, October 2012, Hurricane Sandy hits the East Coast. It's about 20 billion dollars of damage. Big chunk of that was the subway. Um, the subway wanted to renew their cover at the end of the year for floods but surprise surprise the underwriters said you know no thanks we're not we're not touching that again um so instead they issued a parametric policy based on a tide gauge at the tip of manhattan and it says that if water levels get to eight and a half feet so if something like sandy happens again then the subway will get paid money straight away to start making to, to start making its repairs so that is where we saw parametric insurance reducing uncertainty because the underwriter is now only exposed to, does the water get to this depth? It, they're not exposed to, where are all the water ingress points for the tunnels? How many trains are in the tunnels that day? All of these million unknowable data points. They're not exposed to that, just this one point of water hitting the depth. And there also massively reduces the cost because there's no loss adjustment process. A report from McKinsey I said re uh, read recently suggested that loss adjustment costs for a typical insurer could be, you know, often about sort of 10 to 20 percent, which you know, in a time of you know, in a time of um, cost challenges, is huge, right? Yeah. Um, so parametric insurance gets rid of that process. It gets rid of the uncertainty, and that is why in this in this this future climate, parametric insurance is the best and most efficient way to cover these low frequency, high severity events. And um, it's a question I want to ask all of you, actually. Um, do you think that, um, that insurers are adopting new practices fast enough? You know, are they, be, are they being, uh, <coughs> what's the word I'm looking for? Are they being agile enough, I suppose, to, to offer, you know, new, um, new policies or new, new ways of um, tackling climate change? Or are they really behind the curve? Um, I'm going to come to Johnny here first, actually. So how... how are insurers adopting new practices fast enough? Or are they a bit of a laggard when it comes to that? I mean, I think like most most good questions, the answer is it depends. Um, I think there are definitely insurers that are, that are ahead of that curve. Um, but I think this is not a kind of one moment in time. This is something that's going to be a direction of travel over the next you know, years and decades. So there are definitely early adopters. Um, and you know, some of the partnerships that, that we have in place, which we'll hopefully we come, come on to talk about, are good examples of that. Um, but again, I think it's, it's, it's about getting this into the kind of the culture and the DNA of the, of the insurance market. Um, so there's certainly um, examples where individual parts of organizations are striving forward, but it's about bringing that whole organization along with you um, and, and yeah, there's, there's still a long way to go, but I think the positive sign is that you know, this space has been developing rapidly over the last sort of five years in the kind of insure tech scene, and, and there's been a lot of progress in that time, and that will, that will continue. What do you think, Jamie? <laughs> Starting with what we said you shouldn't do. If you look at history, yeah. <laughs> the insurance industry has actually been very resilient to natural hazards. Um, if you go back probably to the the biggest spike in insured losses, which is Hurricane Andrew in 1992, eight insurance companies in Florida went insolvent. Hurricane Katrina came along in 2005, which had an insured loss of 40 billion relative, well, depending on how you classify it, 40 to 60 billion against Andrew's 15 billion. No insurance company in Louisiana or in, went bankrupt. So over that 15 year period, better resilience, that's when cap modeling really started to emerge. So insurers started to build this resilience. It was maybe reactive, but it does have a history of dealing with natural hazards. The only problem is in the last five years, the frequency and severity started to go through the roof. And now people are really starting to creak. I mean, reinsurance, reinsurers that are in property catastrophe haven't met their cost of capital for the last five years. Um, so they've sort of been the bearers of this risk but now they're being hit, mm. but they do actually have a history of bouncing back and incorporating these new methodologies. Um, so I think, you know, if you're holding stock in a reinsurance company or an insurance company as an investor, you're probably sort of the easiest difficult question to ask is climate change. So you, I think people are very much aware of it and I think the industry will react. And I think it's actually, given its history, um, we believe that the solution from a risk quantification perspective 
will come from the insurance industry. Um, it has the history of being as close to solving this risk mm -hmm. as any industry has been in the past. Um, so I think it will come from that, but it just needs to just tweak a little bit the way it does things. Um, but it does have a track record in doing that. It's just a natural evolution. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Jamie. I think I've like lost count of the amount of, you know, in short tech conferences I've been at or like, you know, in short tech companies I've seen that have started with the phrase insurance has stayed the same for 300 years and like we're going to change it. And it's like, well, actually, the main reason something stays the same for 300 years is because it works pretty well. Right. And the and the and I think you're absolutely right to give the industry its credit there um, that, it, that it has that it has worked well. Um, you know, I think the, the the topic we're talking about today is that, is, you know, actually now we are starting to see... Yeah, I mean, you're seeing a signal that extent. you have to think about things slightly differently. I mean, that's why the company's called Reask because you have to, okay, I'm used to these annual policies or these shocks that happen pretty rarely, but these things are changing so significantly that I don't think that signal's in my model. So I just need something else just to check that. You say a one in 50 year event. I mean, what does that mean if you're looking back at historical records that only go back to 1950? You don't know what happened before. So you need to have more information to validate the statistics that you that you've observed. Right. And the and I think the the you know, for everything that, that, that they are doing, there's still so much more that that can be done, right? You know, we always talk about the the protection gap, um, you know, which for flooding alone every year fifty eight billion dollars of damage goes uninsured, right? Which is more than eighty percent of of catastrophic flood losses. And you like the whole point of the insurance industry, like particularly the sort of catastrophe insurance end of the spectrum that, you know, that the three of us and our teams work in is to protect people from catastrophe. Like, that is why I believe so passionately in insurance. It's not about, you know, paying for someone's cracked mobile phone screen. It's about forgetting somebody and their livelihoods back online as fast as possible when the when the worst happens and if more than 80 percent of catastrophe losses aren't being covered then then you can't say the industry is doing enough at the moment at the moment and that is why using new technologies like like new high resolution catastrophe models like iot like parametric insurance you know that is the way that we're going to start reducing that protection gap and start covering more people saving more livelihoods and helping more people recover from catastrophe yeah i wanted to to focus a bit more on on the uh on the customer here or on the consumer uh johnny how is um, how is movement in this area positively <coughs> impacting the consumer um yes yeah, so i'm going to focus on a kind of win-win i think where customers are benefiting and insurers are too so like, what we're, what we're really focused on at previsico is providing um warnings ahead of events so we have um, we have a few solutions, um, but we have a forecasting uh, model which lets our customers know um, up to two days in advance when a flash flood is going to hit a property of theirs. Um, so we work with insurers who then provide this service to their to their end customer. Um, so what that means for the for the customer obviously is that they're getting a notification hours in advance saying this thing is coming, you need to do something. So they can put in place their flood action plan, they can move stocks and assets, move cars, whatever it is, um, which is going to reduce any claim that they might make. Um, and it also means they can get back on their feet more quickly. So 40% of SMEs will go under if they get flooded. So if you can give them that information beforehand, that's hugely beneficial. Um, from the insurer perspective, it means reduced claims, um, reduced exposure, um, but also, I think the really interesting part is that it can bring insurers closer to their customers. So historically, insurance has not been great at building those kind of relationships. Um, and Adam was talking about McKinsey earlier. McKinsey talk about moments of truth, which are like, you know, the sort of the really important parts of a relationship with, a, with an organization and the, and the moments where as an organization, you can kind of go above and beyond, build loyalty, build advocacy, build trust. And, and I think that's difficult for insurance. Whereas if we start looking at this more preemptive approach to, to insurance, it's more about predicting the event beforehand, um, then that's hugely elevating to the proposition. Um, and I think from, you know, from the insurer perspective, it can be a massive point of differentiation in terms of building that relationship. Mm. I just, yeah, I think on the, on the, you know, on the topic of, you know, where this has worked well for customers, I think, you know, I, a story that I'd love to, to tell is one for which for me is with the first time this idea of parametric insurance, you know, stopped just being a thing we can talk about on panels at conferences and start to being a thing that, had, you know, really save, save livelihoods and really save people from catastrophe. Um, 
and that was February 8th, 2020. So just before COVID hit. Um, it was also my co-founder Ian's birthday, which is why I, you know, one reason I remember the date so well. Um, it was a Sunday and up to this point, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd sold our first set of parametric flood policies around the UK, but there had not been a storm event at that point. So, you know, brokers would say to us like, you know, guys, this sounds like a really great idea, but you know, have you ever actually paid anybody? And we'd have to say, oh no, but I promise that we will when it happens. Um, and this was the day when it happened. So this is when Storm Kiara hit, um, you know, and it was a devastating event flooding and flooding across the UK. Um, you know, and we had a series of flood flash centers go off and, and, and all of those claims, you know, settled within, you know, within days of the event. Um, and we, you know, had one customer, um, uh, in, in, in a place called Todmorden, which is, you know, uh, in the Calder Valley, had, had more than its fair share of floods over the last few years. Um, uh, his name is Martin. He runs an egg packaging factory. Um, insurers had turned away from him. Uh, I think his primary insurer, I think, was Aviva. Um, the uh, had left him with a two hundred thousand pound excess on his policy that he would not be able to afford to 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 get back up and running if he had to had to pay that. So we, flood flash is a no brainer for him. He buys that and it works and it pays him out within hours of this event. His business survives. And so we have Martin like on video. You can see this on flood flash's website on video, swearing on his child's life that taking out the flood flash policy was the best thing he's done for five years. And I have not heard people talk about any product like that, let alone an insurance product, right? You know, insurance is not something people have that much love for normally, but to have saved people's livelihoods and to have helped more people recover from catastrophe using parametric insurance, you know, that is how this is working for the customer. Okay, I like that. It's a really good example. Um, how are new climate risk technologies addressing the uh, protection gap that exists as well, particularly in uh, both developed and developing countries? Um, I'm going to ask you first, Adam, then Jamie, I'm going to come to you for that as well. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of the, those technologies that we've that we've that we've talked about, like increased increased computing power, um, IoT networks um, are allowing us to to, you know, model model catastrophes in a resolution and monitor those those catastrophes uh, in a way that the, the wasn't possible before. I think it's true to say, or it's certainly, you know, 95% true to say that every policy Flood Flash has written is, is new premium to the insurance industry. So by that, what I mean is, you know, in the UK, flood insurance is not typically sold as a standalone product line, right? You know, most people, unless you live in the Calder Valley or Carlisle, you know, you've never thought of buying flood insurance because it's just included with your main property policy, whether you're a homeowner or whether you're a business. Um, you only do that if your traditional insurer is saying, I'm going to exclude flood losses. Um, you know, those are, the, those, are the, those are the people that we, that we need to cover and they're not being covered at the moment. So by using parametric insurance in the way that Flood Flash does to be able to cover them, we have, you know, we're not just pulling premium away from somebody else, we've actually grown the size of the whole insurance market. And that means covering risk that wasn't covered before, which means closing that protection gap. Um, you know, and we're only at the first bit of that $58 billion a year, um, but you know, that's, that's, you've got to start at the start. Jamie? Yeah, I guess we, we see it from our own company. I mean, this idea that RIOS model is global, it means that when we think about tropical cyclone risk, it's modeled in exactly the same way as it is in the US, as it is in China, as it is in Japan. This actually gets around the data issues that we've had in the past. I mean, when we were at RMS, it was just, the US is the best model because they have the best data. If you go to other parts of the world, it's maybe, we call them tier two, tier three. The data's not as good, it means your model's not as good. If you have a globally consistent model that tackles climate change, that has high resolution information on the hazards, you know, how often does a certain type of hurricane occur in Australia? That allows you to treat insurance on a global scale in exactly the same way. So we actually see a lot of, like similar to yourself, we see a lot of new policies in regions where maybe insurance hasn't been as high in terms of penetration. So we see a lot of queries for our product coming in in Southeast Asia, where there's no other model in the world to do this stuff. So we're enabling the market to provide new policies in new areas. But it's not just innovation in data and technology, it's also innovation in insurance. It's a parametric insurance. Yes, it's an old product theoretically, but it's only really getting noticed now because people are realizing that you need to think about different ways to insure people in different locations. You need to innovate. It's not just, you know, some guy sitting in Lloyd's signing his signature and taking on a risk. It's okay. 
let's build a technology platform where anyone can quote at any location and then we can do it straight away. You know, find the value along the value chain, strip out that cost, strip out that cost, make it more efficient. Um, so the innovation in the insurance product is also driving that forward. And I think people probably have this consensus view that parametric insurance will help close that protection gap because I think it's more of a more of an enabler in getting you closer to that risk and we enable that from a technology perspective yeah uh, john anything to add on that um <coughs> no it's pretty good okay good comprehensive answers <laughs> okay um jamie i'm going to stick with you here for another question um where do you see the the future of insurance in relation to climate change we talked briefly about the future um so yeah, where do you see it in relation to, to climate change? We'll probably take this around the panel as well. I guess this relates to the question earlier around what is the industry doing? It has this long track record of being resilient or building resilience to the impacts from natural disasters. Our belief is that we want to support the industry to do that um, because the alternative is actually pretty scary. Imagine if you couldn't get insurance globally. This has significant knock-on impacts for the resilience of the global economy. Um, and then if you think about that, we always think about insurance being sort of the first protector against natural catastrophes. As we said, the history shows that the insurance industry has been bearing this risk. It's exactly what they do. In financial terms, maybe you could call it the most junior tranche of climate-related risk. But we get quite nervous when we think about it. We try to think about all these kind of scenarios that you haven't seen or could have seen that might mean that there's other emerging risks in other financial products. If insurance is down here just getting hit all the time by these natural disasters, there's actually this interconnected web of other financial products that you might have not seen in the past. Again, this today's future is not the past, but they could emerge in the future. I mean, one thing that we've been thinking about is obviously last month, Hurricane Ian made landfall in Florida. Uh, you can see it in the press, but obviously that's an insurance event. Um, but there's also been an influx of wealth into Florida. People have been moving to the coast, buying homes. A lot of those homes are actually being bought cash. And if you don't have a mortgage, you don't need insurance. So mortgages and insurance are connected. If you don't have a mortgage, you don't have insurance and your house gets hit, you have to pay it yourself. Not only that, if it's more susceptible to hurricanes, it's going to devalue. And a third of wealth in the US is from homeowners' equity. So you have this interconnectedness that you probably haven't seen before, but it only becomes realistic if you get more extreme events or the frequency increases or the severity increases. So we're thinking that actually there's other risks that the financial industry is going to bear in the future that it probably hasn't seen before. I mean, we're getting requests from people saying corporates with factories in certain locations and they're going, okay, there's a factory here. How's this, how is the risk or the cost of damage from climate change going to affect? It's not just the cost of their insurance, but it's okay. If something bad happens, people can't get to work. So you've got, you know, loss of value added from the workforce. Infrastructure locally could be down. Your goods could be down, supply chain issues. So again, it's this thinking about correlation of risk. Um, we always want to think about risk in, in the right. We think about risk every day. Okay, what, what could happen? And that's when you build predictive models, that's how you kind of self-validate them. Johnny? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think my, my starting point probably is um, what the Environment Agency said pre-COP26. Um, it's adapt or die, basically. You know, the the level of volatility now means that the historic models and business model for insurance is not going to be sustainable going forward. So, fundamentally, firstly, the business model has to change, and it has to become more about being um, anticipating and preventing um, before the event. Um, I think in order to do that, there has to be a greater focus on customer centricity, whether that's an individual or, or an organization. So insurers need to understand their customers better. Um, so you know, Adam's already kind of referred to like you know, IoT, um, but also it's just, just more investment in, in data in terms of understanding that end customer, um, which is good because we have higher expectations than ever as consumers um, and as businesses. So insurance needs to, to respond to that. Um, so I think, I think that, that shift from being, um, you know, where your touch point is after the event to your touch point being before and being more focused on protecting your customers, I think is going to be a really big thing. 
Um, and then I think I'd say the other thing in terms of insurance is there's actually a really exciting kind of talent opportunity. And talent is something that um, I think insurance has struggled with historically. Um, but if we think about climate change, um, insurance has a really good story to tell there. Um, it has a really good story to tell in terms of how it protects society, how it protects individuals, um, how it can respond to these events. Um, so I think actually there's a, there's a great opportunity there for, for insurers to, to tell that story and, and bring more talent into, into the space. And Adam, final thought from you? Yeah, I mean, I'm an, uh, you know, I'm an optimist, right? I think, you know, both the human race and the insurance industry, uh, not that those two things are, you know, entirely overlapping, but they, uh, you know, have both demonstrated their ability to innovate and change, adapt or, adapt or die, in, you know, in, 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 Johnny's, um, in Johnny's phrase. Um, I do believe that, you know, we, you know, in both of those senses, the industry and the, you know, and the and, and us as a species have the the brain power and the wherewithal to be able to use the, use you develop and use technologies to be able to navigate us through, you know, arguably the the biggest crisis in in in, in human history. Um, insurance is a vital part of that you know it's, it's just we were saying you know it is insurance makes the world go round planes don't take off without insurance businesses don't take off without insurance the buildings don't go up without in, with without insurance you know it is it is absolutely it is absolutely necessary and insurance has been thinking about climate and climatic perils for longer and more deeply than other industries have and I, so I do think insurance is is going to be the one that the that, that leads the way Okay, well, that's a, that's a positive message to end on. Um, you're right, you are an optimist, which I like. Um, I think we'll leave it there, probably. Unless there are any burning questions from the audience, this is your last chance to put your hand up and ask a question. I wasn't expecting a response. It's the last session of the day. I thought you all looked like you wanted to go home. Um, so please join me in thanking our panellists. We've got Adam, Johnny and Jamie. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.